Good morning and good afternoon. This is Kristen Schloss and I'm with Razorleaf Corporation. I would like to welcome you to the Razorleaf's Achieving a Connected Digital Thread webinar series. This is our first webinar in the series, Realizing the Digital Thread Vision with PLM. Today, our experts will be showcasing a blueprint on the critical steps within your PLM journey. I'm pleased to introduce our two expert speakers. Jonathan Scott, our Chief Architect. He is our digital transformation evangelist, promoting the use of digital thread and digital twin concepts for over 20 years. He's former solution architect, project manager, and technical consultant on multiple PLM and CAD platforms. His background is in mechanical engineering in both nuclear and transportation industry. Derek Beattie is our engagement director. Derek has over 20 years of experience in engineering and manufacturing, including working in regulated medical industry. He helps clients with their automation, integration, and digitization of processes, utilizing best practices and methodologies. Before I hand this over to Derek, just a few housekeeping notes. First, this webinar will be recorded. We will be sharing this recording to all participants as well as registrants. If one of your colleagues was not able to attend, we encourage you to share this recording. Also during this webinar, we will value your opinions and encourage questions. To ask a question, please enter on the GoToWebinar question panel at any time during this presentation. We will have a Q&A session at the conclusion of this presentation. Now I'm gonna hand this over to Derek. Great, thank you very much, Kristen. Thanks for joining us as well. Jonathan and I are excited to have you with us and to talk with you through this uh, idea of the digital thread. Um, the title, Realizing the Digital Vision, the Digital Thread Vision through PLM, that's really what we're here to talk about. Let's kind of back up a little bit and start with a definition of the digital thread. And so we would define the digital thread of as, as a set of connected records of the data and activities which define a product. Jonathan, I think you'd probably agree that that's a good definition, but if I could ask you, could you dissect it a little bit for us? Break it down. What does that definition really mean? Yeah, that, that's a great question, Derek, because I think there's a lot of words in there, but each sort of points out an important aspect or characteristic of the digital thread and what makes it different from a lot of the other buzzwords that we hear about in this industry. So I'm going to start from the bottom up. Um, the, the part about which define a product, that really is about narrowing the scope of digitalization in, in its broader context, right? Everybody has heard about digitalization and the news, and we see it in TV commercials even, um, talking about digitizing your business and that kind of thing. Well, digitalization is a, a topic that touches on every aspect of an organization or a business. The digital thread really narrows down to talk about product related information. So it's not about finance, it's not about HR, it's not about those areas of a business, it's really everything related to the product. So moving up to that second line, okay, data and activities, What what is that really getting at? Data is the part we're probably all expecting, right? And product data is something a lot of people are familiar with. It's CAD files, it's specification documents, it's bills of material, it's things like that. Um, that we're all used to, they, they define the product. And when people talk about PDM systems and stuff like that, it's product definition, product data. So I'll assume everybody's thinking of that already. The activities part is what's interesting because activities are the processes, the, the tasks, the actions, the things that we do to generate that data. That's just as important and it's a part of the digital thread. So think uh, tasks in a project, think, uh, steps in a workflow process or a change process, something like that. Think meetings, decisions, uh, the, the things that are, are fuzzier, they're not, they're not data, right? Uh, but they help make the data. So those two pieces are important. And then the, the top line uh, piece of the definition here, connected records, that's the last piece that's really unique and interesting, is for it to be a thread, obviously, we need to tie all this together. We need to connect these pieces. So the data and the activities are interesting. That's interesting. That's good information. But if you just have that in a big ball or a big pile, it's kind of a digital 
you know, ball of yarn. It's not really a digital thread. It, you can't untangle it. You can't understand it. You can't follow the, the process or the train of thought. The connected records piece helps give us that, that continuity, that connection from one thing to the next, and the real crisp context of that product data and the activities of that product data. So I think when you parse it out, it really gives you a better picture of what do we mean by digital thread, not just the stuff we thought of traditionally with PDM and PLM. Does that help yeah, there? That, no, that's great. That That's a good definition. I really like, like the part about connecting the records because in reality, when you describe the data and the activities, a lot of us, we have that but it's not connected in, in a way to provide the value that the digital thread can provide. That actually right. leads to my next question is, all right, why do I care? What is the value of putting that stuff, connecting it together? That's great, Derek. That's, and as you might expect, I, I've got an answer for that, right? So uh, what, what are the benefits of a digital thread? Uh, like you're saying, I mean, um, I think it's valuable to different organizations for different reasons. So not everybody, these these same benefits, um, and I want to come back to that, and I'll come back to that in a few minutes, I think, um, or at least we should. But there are three benefits of the digital thread that I see coming up again and again when we work with customers on this. The first one is decision support, and what I mean by that is, can the digital thread give you information to help support decisions? And and I think yes, it can, and it's actually very powerful at that. So we all know that. Um, you make better decisions when you have better information. More information, usually, right? That helps too. But if it's more information that isn't decipherable, it, it's not always better information. So it may or may not help your decision making. But if you've got good, crisp, understandable information and more than you had yesterday, you're going to make a better decision today when you've got that to leverage. So let me give an example here. Imagine that uh, you're in a product company and a VP comes to you, say you're the engineering manager, VP comes to you and says, look, we've got this great product. We've had it on the market for 10 years. We've upgraded it several times. It's our best seller. It's wonderful. But I'm concerned that maybe we need to replace it. We need to, to create a new product that takes its place. But I don't know. It's been a cash cow for us. Maybe we should just upgrade and refresh it again. Hey, Mr. Engineering Manager, what should I do? Let, let me know. Tell me what our direction should be and why. That's one thing. It'd be one thing to answer that question if you're the engineering manager who's been there for the 10 years that product's been around. But imagine you weren't. Imagine you just stepped into the role six months ago. If you had a digital thread, you had the information, you could go surf it, so to speak, and figure out the what's, the why's, the how's, the things that had been considered and turned down and accepted and the, the changes that took place and the, the updates to the product that were needed, how the market shifted. And that was all connected so you could get through it like a story. Um, that would be one thing. If you just had to go around to the different cubes and offices and ask people, well, what do you think? That's a different animal. So that kind of decision support of concretely being able to access the product record and its history, that's a huge benefit to the digital thread. Another one I see coming up a lot is automation. So with the increase of digital information today, right, we got lots of data with the decrease in the cost of computing, right? You can go tie into a cloud service, purchase some compute hours, whatnot, for you know pennies uh, an hour. There's a lot we can do to automate the kind of analysis and simulation that happens when we're developing products. Um, that's, that's good, but the automation stops when you have to go collect data, when humans have to manually figure out which data is the right data to apply to run through the simulation. So my, my point here at the bottom about goal plus design plus constraints equals optimized result, that's really where digital thread can pay off. Because if you've captured the goal, right, if you know what your goal is to reduce weight in a product or to reduce cost or to balance those two somehow, and you have the design, right? What have I designed so far? What is my existing design? What are my design parameters, that kind of thing. And you know the constraints, the load conditions, um, the, the market conditions, other things that would put a box or some bounds around what you need to do. If you can plug that in and you've got the computational solver to address those, 
then you can run it again and again. You can optimize the result. You can even have the result being optimized in the background and do trade analysis and goal seek and things like that. That's tremendous. If you have to get a human in the middle of it to do those things, you slow down the whole process. But with a digital thread, when all the data is there and connected and stays connected, this automation becomes extremely powerful. And it gets us to things like AI and machine learning. The last one I'll mention that I see, um, this, this is a tough one because you know the other two, you can really convince somebody that's a good reason to go out and build it. And you know, you're gonna see some tremendous benefit in the future from it. The forensics one here sometimes is about mitigating bad things instead of making good things happen. But I'll give you an example. If we go back in the news a couple of years, probably four or five years ago, there was a series of news stories about product failures, um, some coming from China, it's not all related to, to that, but some with quality issues. The one I'm thinking of in particular was, I think, lead paint on the toys, uh, lead paint on toys coming from China, and those products were finding themselves around the world, and kids were getting sick, and you know all kinds of bad issues there. When you think about that situation and a product manufacturer, and what do they need to do to react, really speed is everything in a crisis. So can they figure out what happened, why it happened, how broad is the impact? Uh, what do we need to do for product recalls? That sort of thing. Having these kinds of forensics at your fingertips to be able to answer those questions quickly is invaluable in a crisis like that. So like I said, that's about mitigating bad things. Sometimes though, it, it, it could be a little more positive that you think something bad may happen and you want to head it off at the pass. Uh, you want to figure out how bad it is and what you can do to proactively solve it. Imagine that same kind of problem, like a quality issue. You're having a quality issue at a manufacturing plant and you go to investigate and you look at that part and you say, oh, the root cause here is a material issue. Well, wait a minute. How many places have I used that material? Okay. How many of those places are in different product lines? How many of those product lines are active? You know, you start to ask those questions and you can trace down the answers in instance, right? I mean, very, very quickly, if you've got a digital thread to follow, if you don't, you know, your investigation is taking weeks and, and maybe the, the horse is out of the barn by the time that you've answered the question and figured out how bad the impact is. So this is invaluable, but it is about mitigating uh, bad things ahead of time or trying to. With that, I, I think you may, a company may want multiple of these benefits or may need them. The tricky part is you have to start building out the digital thread well in advance of needing one of these to be able to get that benefit from it. But those are some of the things, Eric, I would say that people yeah. look for digital thread to give them benefits on. Yeah, that, that makes sense. You know, some of those things you mentioned, it, it's as if, if you don't do something proactive by the time you realize you need it, it's too late. You can't, you can't go build it to make those decisions once one of those events happen. So that, that was, that was good stuff. You, you obviously convinced me. I'm not sure that I needed a lot of convincing, but, but that was very helpful. Um, but if, if it's this important, if it's this valuable, um, what do I buy? Where, who, who's, are the major engineering software manufacturers making a digital thread product that I can just go buy and implement? Yeah, fair question, Derek. I mean, it, if it's really this good, can I buy one? Um, and the answer is no, you, you can't just go buy a digital thread, but there's some reasons for that. Um, let, me, let me touch on that. There are a number of variables behind a digital thread that make it unique to a company or unique to an organization. Um, but I'll name four that, that I see really causing variation across different types of digital threads. The first is the industry you're in. So we all know that the people who make airplanes like Boeing, that's a manufacturer, right? But you know, Nike, Reebok, New Balance, people that make shoes, guess what? They're also a manufacturer. Um, we can pick lots of different industries. Manufacturing is a pretty broad space, but we know that Boeing and Nike make their products pretty differently. Right? It's a pretty different animal. One's got a 30 year life, the other maybe has a, a one year life in terms of product life cycle. So what does that mean though, in terms of their, their digital thread? Well, let's go back to Boeing for a second. I'll tell you what matters to them. Now I'm not inside their business, but when I look at the business of making airplanes, there's a lot of money and time tied up in making one. And the decisions you make early on in the process have huge implications to the cost of the product later on. So these folks spend a lot of time on systems engineering upfront. 
looking at the different disciplines that go into their product, mechanical, electrical, aerodynamics, uh, software, all those things, and figuring out what are the trade-offs between, well, if I do it this way, I do it that way, analyzing it, running early simulations. So that kind of systems work is really important to them. It's a huge part of their digital thread. A lot of the downstream work needs to tie back to that. You look at somebody who's making a shoe or making clothing, fashion, apparel, that kind of thing, systems engineering doesn't have a big role. But what does? Well, what's critical to them is the cycle time, right? You, If you're in fashion, you have to get things rolled out every three months, every season, something's new. So to have that kind of cycle time and to be able to repeatedly deliver four times a year or more often than that, your projects, your processes, they have to be just on point. So things like project management, program management are critical. Pick another industry. Um, people who make equipment for factories. That kind of industrial equipment, usually it's expensive, it's multidiscipline, so some aspects like aerospace might apply. Um, but they have other things like product structures, really critical because a lot of times they're selling uh, options and variants of their product. Oh, you want my machine, but this option, that option, this power, that height, that size. So product structure is critical to them. We're going to talk about some of these components of digital threads later, but you get the idea. The industry can drive a lot about what your thread looks like. The tools and technologies that you use can drive that also. So, for example, are you a file-based kind of company or are you fully onto the cloud already? Do you use a lot of CAD or really do you define your products more with documents? Um, how do you how do you manage that stuff today? Do you do it all in one tool or do you use a bunch of best of breed tools? So all of these things could factor into what you need to tie together in your thread. Another variable, what about methodologies and processes? How do you do business? I'll give you one great example here, even though there are a couple that, that could play into this. If you're aware of the model-based movement, model-based design, model-based enterprise, that sort of thing, think back to what that spectrum looks like, right? So for creating geometric content, dimensions, tolerances, stuff like that about a product, 30 years ago, we've got paper, right? 20 years ago, we've got lots of 2D drafting. Uh, 10, 15 years ago, we've got 3D modeling where we still create 2D drawings. Today, people are really getting into and exploring this idea of 3D MBD, model-based definition, where it's just a 3D model. Well, it, depending on what you're doing there, where your business is, your thread looks a lot different, right? Uh, the model-based enterprise world has a lot of unique issues around configuration management that you'd have to deal with. Last variable I'll talk about is, what's the purpose of your digital thread? This can have a tremendous impact on what your thread looks like. So an example, take an industry where, let's pick something like a, an Uber or uh, like Lime scooters today, right? They're not trying to sell scooters. They're trying to sell personal mobility, right? So what you buy from them is the ability to go pick something up and use it to get from point A to point B. What's critical in their business is that the scooters that they make and they put all over the country everywhere, those have to be available. Availability is the number one thing to them. It has to just work, right? So their products have to work all the time and it's incumbent on them to make it work. They're not the kind of business where, oh yeah, I sold you a car, but um, you know, a good portion of my revenue is from the parts and the service I get out of it. So, okay, if I'm in a business where that matters, a product as a service, then you know what I really need to be profitable, I need to be able to predict the availability of that product. I need a digital twin. And we can talk more about digital twin in a minute, but to get a good digital twin, you need a digital thread to serve as the foundation for that. It provides the data and the connectivity and all that context to build your digital twin. So some people, that might be why they're creating a digital thread is to get to a digital twin. Well, let me shift and go to an industry that, that I used to work in, the nuclear industry. Why might they want a digital thread? Okay, a digital twin might be interesting to them too. I'm not saying it's not, but that's a, an aging industry. There are tons of people with tons of experience retiring out of that industry. And those companies in that space really need to capture knowledge. They need to, to get that into systems and out of the heads of the people who have it. They might be building a digital thread for that purpose. And it, again, that one looks very different than what you would build for uh, looking for a digital twin. So there's a lot of reasons why these digital threads are pretty unique to companies. 
uh, it's, so it's hard to say that somebody, well, it's hard to believe that somebody could go sell a digital thread. You really need to build your own using components that you could buy, but they are unique. And I don't think we're gonna see digital threads for sale anytime soon. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. But unfortunately you took me from, I was all on board that this, this was the thing that my company needed to, wow, that sounds like a big challenge. There, there has <laughs> to be things that are common or shared um, you know, among these different variables that would allow me to to start in a in a sensible way to to start small to grow. Uh, how do you do that? What are the things that are common um, and are shared among these different variables? Yeah, absolutely, Derek. Uh, and, and you're right. I've, I've kind of whipsawed you with the you know, isn't this great? But isn't it hard? It's it's not as hard as I maybe I made it sound with all those variables. But it it's just you have to think about what's important to you. So let, let's start by talking about the most common elements of a digital thread. And uh, we got this graphic of the digital thread that we've been using um, for, for a while at Raise Relief. Um, and it, it helps us talk with customers about the common elements. Now, in the context of a particular company and their situation, some of these elements may not apply at all. So this isn't meant to be a universal, it's just really sort of a set of talking points about digital threads. And it, it very well may be that uh, in a particular company situation, there are other elements that we need to pull in because that's how furniture makers work or, you know, pick your industry. So let's just go through those. Let's take each element in turn. And what I'd like to do is in that, that picture, I'd like to talk about each one and what is that piece of the thread? What do I mean by it? Why does that piece matter? Why is it relevant or important to people generally? Who owns it within an organization? Because this is a big question a lot of people don't think about, and it's a big challenge with the digital thread because it's not, the, the thread doesn't belong to one person. And then how is it being done? Now, there's of course tons of variability there too, but I'm just gonna give people a snapshot. If you're not familiar with one of these components, you may be surprised when you hear, oh, wait, that's how people do it? Uh, yeah, so we'll talk a little bit about that as we go also. So I'll just take each one in turn. Starting with requirements. So what, what's requirements traceability? What's that component? Um, so requirements express what a customer wants, right? What are they asking for? But it does it in a way that the rest of the organization can take action on it, right? That engineering can provide a design that meets that. So requirements aren't just, you know, wishes and dreams and hopes. It's things nailed down and described in a way that a product can try to satisfy. This is really important because it connects that product definition back to why are we doing it? Why are we doing it that way? So that when you need to make changes later, you really should be connecting it back to a change in requirements. You know, no, we didn't decide to replace that component with one that's twice its cost and twice its weight for the fun of it. We didn't do it because that's, you know, the chief engineer liked the way it looked. It was done because the customer's requirement changed from this to that. They needed it to last longer. They complained about the way it looked, that sort of thing. So this traceability and this documentation of requirements is really important for everybody to understand why a bunch of time and energy and money is spent inside the company. Who owns these? This varies, but sales and marketing are frequently the folks that own these, uh, lots of customer facing roles, because they're the ones who talk to the customer and understand what they want. Now, a lot of times engineering will help shape these, marketing does too, but a lot of times uh, it's sales and marketing that own it and, and can pull it out of customers or study the market to figure it out. And the trouble is though, the how, that you're gonna see that the how is trouble for a lot of these. These are frequently captured in meeting notes, in emails, in uh, customer relationship management systems. And that means that a lot of times, unfortunately, they're, they're hidden. They may be captured, sales knows about it, but does engineering, you know, does engineering realize that that customer is having that issue with the, the software or with the product or whatnot? So a lot of times it's, it's in these other systems or sort of informal or ad hoc. Next component here, systems engineering. This is very closely related to requirements management, but it's its own thing. Um, systems engineering data is that that full picture of the product, of what, what does it look like? How's it architected? How's it gonna behave? Those sorts of things, but it's not fully detailed. It's conceptual, it's early, and, and it includes trade-offs. So let me give you an example. Um, you wanna transport cargo, right? That's your requirement. I wanna transport cargo across the country. At the systems engineering level, we're not you know, designing tires, we're not designing wheels and chassis and things like that. We're making decisions like, well, do I wanna do that with a tractor trailer or a train? 
or maybe I want to do that with an airplane. Um, what are the trade-offs of doing those? Fuel versus time, having to have infrastructure, you know, big picture questions. That's systems engineering type of content. And why is that important? Just like with requirements, it's very early in the design process. You're making big decisions that have a heavy influence on the rest of the product. The people who own this, in some organizations, it's very formal and there's a systems engineering role or department that does it. But a lot of companies, they wouldn't even call it this. They, they don't put this label on it. It's This is what the chief engineer does. This is what the really experienced uh, person in the organization does because they've got so much history, they know how to make these decisions and what guides them. How do they do it? Well, again, if it's more formal, you'll find specialized tool sets. If it's not, you'll find it in spreadsheets, you know, quick back of the envelope types of calculations that that, that experienced engineer does to say, yeah, here's what we ought to do here. So this is an interesting one. Um, it's really important up front. Not everybody does it. Not everybody calls it this even when they do do it. The next one I want to touch on is, uh, is fun because it's so broad. It's such a catch-all. Product-related content, right? And I, the part of the digital thread here is organizing that product-related content. This, I'll say generally it's documents, right? It's, it's Word documents, it's spreadsheets, it's PDFs, it's that sort of thing, but it could be all kinds of records, but it, it somehow relates to the definition of the product. Uh, materials, material specs, uh, color swatches, um, behaviors, things like that. Why is this so important? Well, because this really varies by industry. Uh, I'll give you an example. The aircraft completions industry, people who make the interior of private jets, uh, they have a process they need to go through related to materials that they put inside the cabin. If you're going to put a certain upholstery on a chair, you have to flame test it because if it catches on fire when the plane's in the air, you could kill people with the smoke if it's noxious. Okay, so a little detail, fun detail about that industry, but they need that. That's really critical, right? They can't get FAA certification without that kind of product-related content. It's not CAD data. It's not you know a drawing, but it's really important. When I give you that kind of example, it probably makes you realize there are lots of people in the organization that can own that, right? From testing to quality to marketing to engineering, design, all sorts of groups. So it's really, really wide here. How's it dealt with? Same problem, right? If it's specialized data, there may be specialized tools, there may be standard formats, it could be general docs, records, systems, it could be all over the map. So this is an interesting one, but a very important one. How about projects? So I've been talking about a lot of data and our definition of digital threat earlier was, you know, data and activities. So here's an activity. Governance of projects is about the, the tasks, the schedules, the deliverables, the things that you do over months or years to launch a product. Why is this so important? Well, you need to do it in a, a disciplined way to shorten your product cycles, to get your product out the door faster. That's important to every company, right? The sooner you get to market, the more the market you capture, the more profit you make. That, of course, is important. It's also important for regulated industries. How did you go about doing this? I need to be, you need to be able to answer questions that show you went through all the right steps. So there are a lot of reasons why this is important. Typically, who's managing this though? You know, a lot of what we've been talking about so far have been the engineers, the designers, the uh, purchasing people, the marketing people, salespeople. This talks about across groups at a certain level. Management usually cares about this. Sometimes it's a project management office, but a lot of times it's engineering managers, manufacturing managers, it's VPs. They need the roll up to understand how to manage the business and looking at where projects are, how long they're taking, which ones are done, whether they have enough people to work on projects, they're interested in this. The trouble again is how is it done? It's often ad hoc, right? Everybody can probably think of the number of times they've gotten an email that says, how close are you to done with this? That's governance of projects, right? That's other people in the organization trying to coordinate work, understanding tasks and timelines. And those are often just in spreadsheets or emails too. Another activity that's worth talking about that definitely relates to the product, change management. Everybody's likely familiar with this, right? Document release processes, engineering change processes like engineering change request, ECO, ECN, that kind of thing. These are critical because 
it's multiple disciplines in the company have to review and approve changes to the product because they, they typically contributed when the product was defined up front. So as we change it, they also have to participate. Who does this? Well, like I said, a lot of people participate, but usually engineering will lead this, right? That they're leading the change. That's why a lot of these processes are called engineering change request, engineering, whatever. Um, so engineering frequently leads it, even though multiple people are involved. And this is done in a number of ways too. Uh, lots of folks do it through email. Um, plenty of companies we see have homegrown systems for this based on access or whatever. Um, so something to help route things around and track because usually there's a high volume of these, right? A lot of changes happen to products over time. What about BOM? So back to data for a minute, BOM and product structure. Uh, this one's got a special place in my heart because it's so central to product information. What is it? It's a structured breakdown of the elements of a product. That's how I'll define it generally, because there are different views of this for different functions in the business, right? So there might be an engineering bomb that looks a certain way, and there might be a manufacturing bomb that's organized a different way. And there might be a sales bomb that's similar, but it's more of a, a high level view of it, just the big features of the major modules, that kind of thing. It's really important though, because it's at the heart of the product definition. You know, the first step in baking a cake is to know what ingredients you need to buy. That's the bomb. So this is critical to the definition of a product. Who cares about this? Like I mentioned, if you've got different views of the bomb, then each of those views probably ties to a department or a function. Everybody cares about their particular view of it because they use it day to day. Unfortunately, these are also managed frequently in an ad hoc way with tools that were not meant for the job, spreadsheets. Spreadsheets are terrible at this but it's the best tool that most people have short of a PDM or PLM system. Um, so that's that's what we see a lot. We see a lot of spreadsheets here. How about CAD? This is one that uh, I suspect, you know, when I started this, if you hadn't looked at our graphic before and you saw me kind of breeze through that, you saw CAD and you're like, that's what I was thinking of. I figured CAD had to be part of the digital threat and it is. What is this? For those of you that, that aren't CAD experts, these are linked collections of files typically now if you're using cloud-based cad that's beautiful you don't have to deal with the files but you still have all these different types of information in there you've got models of individual components you've got assemblies that put those models together to do something useful and those can be sub assemblies and keep building up you may have schematics that describe the function of how things connect or the logic of how things connect and drawings right 2d representations of the 3d that i talked about when i said models and assemblies these are important because much like the bomb this gets at the heart of the product how do you specify the product you know, how, how big is that bracket where are the holes located on that bracket the geometry the dimensions the connections etc those are all critical to mass production today we kind of take this for granted i mean you know it's been 100 years ago that mass production wasn't what we think of today it used to be that that craftsmen had to make every product that you made because you had to make all the parts fit together. You couldn't count on interchangeability. This is what helps us do that. So this really is critical. We often forget and assume it's there. Um, and who does this? Uh, my, my bent is mechanical engineering. So as I described this, you probably think I'm talking about mechanical, but it's also electrical design. It's other types of design as well, but all design engineering type disciplines. And how's it managed? How does it, what form does it take? That's tricky here. Um, a lot of times it's the same types of things that I mentioned when I said the what, but every CAD system has a different flavor, right? Uh, do they put a couple of those things in a single file or a single container? Do they split them all out into their own files? Do they organize them for you? Do they have a project pointer that connects them all or do they leave it up to you to put them in folders and not move them around? This is all over the road, but uh, that's typically how this data shows up is lots and lots of files and sometimes very large files what about configuration management this is a fun one because these two words mean very different things to a lot of people i'm using uh, sort of a an industry definition from the defense industry from the 50s this concept of configuration management is um, a combination of things i've already talked about CAD data documents bills of material, and then the change processes and release processes that tie them all together, that govern those. So it's, it's sort of a, a triangle of the bombs, the structure, the specifications, the CAD and the docs, and then the change that controls those. 
And is it so John, word, is, is, yeah, yeah. is configuration management kind of a digital thread inside of a digital thread? A little bit. Yeah. Hmm. It's um it is connecting those couple of areas and it's you know that's another way of thinking of digital thread it's kind of a an enterprise extension of configuration management or cm interesting good um yeah it's what's really interesting about this is that it's almost like a governance layer riding over tops of those because i mentioned all those things are also dealt with in the the digital thread but when you tie them all together there's a definition uh, a term called baseline that represents the state of a product at any point in time. CM controls the baseline. They're the ones who can tell you, yeah, you know, on Tuesday, October 28th, 1996, this is what the product looked like. This is what the released version was. So um, it's a little bit of an overlay to these other things that we do. And usually there's a dedicated group to do it. Sometimes it's called CM, sometimes it's dot control. And Another challenge here is frequently this is done with paper processes because all those little pieces of data are managed on their own. Like you said, Derek, they're their own little digital thread. CAD data is over here and engineering's managing it and the docs are over here and the materials department's handling it and the bombs are over here. You know, so CM is kind of riding herd over everybody and making sure that their change processes are in order and sometimes they coordinate those, but it's a little bit of an overlay, but something we can't we can't ignore either. We're, we're coming to the end, we're getting there. Um, the next component to talk about is, that's a fancy term, multidiscipline analysis and optimization. MDAO is how a lot of people talk about it. Um, the way I would describe it is it's simulation, that's the simpler term for it, but it's simulation tools coupled with automation tools or optimization tools so that you can combine simulations, right? So that you can say, all right, I wanna know how much does this piece of metal grow or shrink when this heat is applied? I wanna know how much heat is generated when this electromagnetic field is what it's exposed to. And then I really wanna know, well, what happens to the other parts, the loads and forces on the other parts when it deflects because of that heat, because of that magnetism? Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> There's where the multidiscipline part comes in. But that's this whole space, right, is about the simulation tools and the ability to combine them and then optimize. It's critical, right, because it goes back to that automation benefit I said earlier. To explore more prototypes in your product development process is very valuable, right? 20 years ago, it's what every company wanted to do, speed up the prototyping process. Then we got to virtual prototypes. They got so good, computing got so good, we said, well, Man, virtual prototypes are much cheaper, much faster. So of course I can do more. This is just turning that on its head and saying, well, maybe you could do infinite virtual prototypes, right? If you can let the all the analysis happen without people involved and automate it. So you see there's tremendous potential for value there. The challenge has been the who part is you always had to have the PhD analysts involved to run some of these tools and connect some of the data. That has also meant that it's, when it's a niche, it, it stays in these specialized formats. So the how is special tools, special formats. You need to be able to read the tea leaves to understand the outcomes and things like that. So these still have a challenge, but there's tremendous uh, promise here and tremendous value. Manufacturing definition, right? So if, if you're joining this webinar and that's your focus, you're probably wondering, when is he ever going to get to this? Because I keep talking about the product and so far it's all engineering and upfront and analysis and that kind of thing. That's not all there is to the definition of a product. Sometimes how you make it is more important than exactly what you're making. Uh, so what what is this? What, what are manufacturing definition components of the digital thread? maybe this is overly summarized because there could be a lot of things here, right? So if you're doing subtractive manufacturing, maybe it's CNC data. If you're doing additive manufacturing and 3D printing, maybe it's that kind of data. If you're assembling your product, maybe it's work instructions. If you're purchasing your product and there's lots of suppliers that you work with, it's specs for them. All of that's critical because it's helping you define what you make and how you make it both, right? And, and those can both be critical to what you're selling. Who owns this? You know, there's a lot of engineering side of it, right? Manufacturing and industrial engineers, but there's a lot of acquisition side of it too. Planners, purchasing folks, 
you know, that are deciding, well, how do we route it through the shop? Uh, what is the supply chain and how do we qualify people? Um, so lots of folks can own this kind of data, but what does it look like? What form does it take? Well, you got specialized files, like a couple that I talked about earlier, the subtractive and additive manufacturing. Then you've got things that may be in systems like your ERP system or manufacturing execution system that are records, steps, operation sequences, uh, MBOMs, things like that. And then of course, there's also a lot of paper, right? When you're talking about the shop floor, there's always paper involved or frequently there is. So I'm at my last one. Um, let's talk about physical instance tracking. This one is really important because when you're thinking about the digital thread of your product, it's one thing to think about the, the first 10 that I mentioned, right? And that's virtual definition of your product. Here's how it ought to be. Here's what I'm planning for it to be like when I manufacture it. Physical instance tracking adds in that component of, well, what really gets made? What really gets bought? What shows up on the dock at the end of the day? So these are the details about how serial number one and serial number two are different. Did they have different bombs because they get produced at different times? They have different material certs because different batches of materials were used to make them, that kind of thing. There's a lot of data here, um, but it's important because not everything is interchangeable. Right, so sometimes we make part number changes and now we can't swap that subassembly for this subassembly. And when it's time to deliver for customers, whether we're delivering for the end customer or we're doing a product as a service and we need to keep it in service ourselves, you need to know that information. And knowing what your plan was, right, the virtual product definition is one thing. Knowing what's actually out there, what you really delivered is another, so it's critical. Who owns this? This is another thing that's not very standardized. A lot of times it's manufacturing just because of they had the record as it was being built. But sometimes it's sales because they're paying attention to, well, what did the customer buy? And then what did they upgrade to? And what if we serviced for them? That kind of thing. And service, of course, if that group exists, they're keeping track of it a lot of times because they're recording the work they did. Oh, I swapped this out for them. They bought this, that kind of thing. How is this recorded? Another interesting one. This, this frequently, we'll talk about this in a minute, gets us out of PLM or CAN. But MES, Manufacturing Execution Systems and MRP Systems, often track this based on what was built. Oh, this is how it moved through the shop. This is what parts we put into it. That's how we know it was built. But what about how it was maintained? All right, sometimes there are systems for that, like uh, MRO, Maintenance, Repair, and Overhaul, um, Enterprise Asset Management. Lots of different other systems may track this, or lots of companies don't. Right? They want to, and it comes back to spreadsheets. Uh, so it, it really could be all over the map here. That's great. That's good information, Jonathan. That really, the way you went through that really does help um, us understand kind of how all of this is interconnected. Um, they, none of this stuff stands alone, or at least it shouldn't. You, you really need to, to look at all of this data as the product grows and is built and is changed and maintained. That, that was great. Thank you. Yeah. Let's let's connect it to P uh, to PLM. So that's kind of what we're here about. Um, how does everything we went through connect to the PLM system, and how does it map to a PLM system? Yeah, perfect. Right. Uh, let's talk about that. I think the way to think about PLM, the way I think about PLM, is it's it's a collection of modules, and customers put together the modules they need um, to get the benefit that they want to to do the jobs that they needed to do. So I, I want to take that sort of view of things and describe my view of PLM. Um, and, and we'll come back to the digital thread in a minute and see how that relates. But so what I've got here is a list of the most frequently deployed modules of PDM and PLM systems, right? Um, it, Razorleaf, we work with a bunch of PDM and PLM tools in the market today. So this is, they all have slightly different names for their modules, but this is a composite view of, you know, PLM system X. Right, and the kind of modules that they have. And I'm, I'm listing them here in order of frequency um, that we've deployed them or that people have asked us to deploy them. CAD data management, yeah, that's it. And this is sometimes just PDM when it's on its own, but managing those CAD files and all their relationships. Document management, okay, a lot of people do this in another system, they do it in a SharePoint, they, they do it in a pure document management system, but usually when we start getting into PLM, they wanna put the product documents in the PLM system to, to connect it to other things. Change management, this comes up all the time. The instant you start managing CAD data, you need to release it. You need to 
change it, you need to revise it, those sorts of things. So this is another very common one. And once you've got that, like you mentioned earlier, Derek, um, configuration management is kind of a digital thread within a digital thread. The bomb is the last piece of it. So EBOM management, engineering bill of materials, that's the other piece. These come up all the time. When I think about kind of a basic PLM implementation, this is what it looks like. But there are other things too. Uh, we do a lot of work around variants, right? Design automation and people planning their modular products and how do they how do they sell options and features to their products? So that's another one that comes up a lot for us. Program management, coordinating all the activities around these other pieces of data, managing projects and connecting the tasks to deliverables that are the other kinds of things we talked about managing. Um, manufacturing bills of material, right? Engineering bills are probably the most frequent. Uh, sales bills, probably close to that. And manufacturing bills, the reason it comes up in PLM a little less is sometimes people do it in other systems, but this is another common one. And then requirements management. This is coming on more and more these days as people start to take that approach of capturing the definition of the product early on from what's being asked for by the customer. So let me take this and put it in context, right? I wanna kind of draw you a picture of a PLM system, just make a diagram of it and kind of put these on the map. So PLM, I maybe should have mentioned this when I started, product lifecycle management. So I'm gonna oversimplify the life of a product and say it starts with concept, it continues into design. Once we understand that, we talk about how to manufacture it, how to service it, and usually that feeds back to the concept, right? You know, we, in the field, we see how it performs and that gives us new ideas for the next product concept. So it's, it's a cycle. This is kind of the life cycle. I put it in four quadrants. Now let me plop onto this diagram those areas, those modules that I just mentioned, right? So CAD management, doc management, change management, uh, engineering bills and material, those all fit in that sort of design area. This is, again, traditional PLM, what a lot of people look for with sort of out of the box deployments. Sales bomb, right? As you move up in the process and try some more of your product. Project management, this connects three of those phases. You know, I, I'm generalizing here, but project management is taking you from concept into actually being able to roll out and manufacture the thing. Um, the manufacturing side, MBOM and MPP, manufacturing process planning, requirements management. And let me throw in a few more, right? Things I didn't mention in the previous slide. Quality modules, supplier management modules, unit bomb modules, right? So I, I mentioned lots of different views of the bill of material. Unit bomb gets to that physical instance tracking that I was touching on at the end of the, the digital thread, right? So serial number one, what does its bill look like? Serial number two, that kind of thing. Okay. so. Now that I've diagrammed what general PLM looks like, we've kind of got a, a landscape view of PLM. Up at the top, there's the digital thread, that sort of generic digital thread that I described. How does this overlay? How do these map, right? So they map pretty well, right? There is a good alignment um, between these pieces of a digital thread and PLM systems, but it's not perfect, right? Um, and, and not every PLM has all these modules um, and not everyone has a PLM system. And some people just have PDM and other people are doing pieces of an ERP. So, you know, that PLM diagram I drew is also kind of best case. So the takeaway I would offer is that the PLM is loosely aligned with building out the digital thread. So uh, that's, that's fair, but that alignment is imperfect and PLM is often incomplete in terms of the ability to support everything an organization might need in their digital thread, right? Like systems engineering and MDAO, those, those areas, you see they're out on the fringe. So that, that would be my takeaway in terms of how do they relate. Nice. So, so when, you, when you take all that into consideration, how do we advise people if, if they potentially have incomplete PLM or potentially have incomplete digital thread? How do we advise people to realize this vision of digital thread with that being the case? Yeah, Derek, I mean... It's, it's tricky and, and simple all at the same time. So this is gonna sound simple. Um, and it's actually quite a lot of work to do what I'm saying here, but I typically suggest people follow these steps. Number one, they need to define their vision so that everyone can understand it. So if you got some concept in your mind of the digital thread that you want, you gotta define it and write it down so that everybody can get on the same page with you about it. Two, you need to take stock of what you have 
do you have PLM, PDM, CAD? Do you have these pieces? Where do you do them today? So take stock of what you've got. Three, identify the gaps between what you have and what you need, right? A lot of people think that it's simple gap analysis, but you have to take stock where you're at, figure out where you wanna be and say, well, what am I missing? What do I need to put in place? And then the fourth thing you need to do is build a plan, or a lot of people would call that a roadmap, for how are you gonna close those gaps? What are you gonna put in place? In what order? Can you justify it? Will it benefit your business as you go? That kind of thing. So, you know, define your vision, take stock of what you have, figure out the gaps, and then build a plan. It sounds simple. Yeah. There's a lot of work to it, but that's what I would advise people to do. No, that, that, that's great. And Jonathan, thanks for walking us through that. I mean, you know, starting with just the definition of the digital threat and kind of understanding what we mean by it, I'm um, digging into the value that it brings and then going through each of those components and understanding what they are and, and how they're connected to each other. Um, that was that was great. Um, finally, kind of mapping it to where PLM is or should be. Uh, that I think that really helps get us all on the same page. So so appreciate all of that. Uh, you know, I think that that um, uh, this really helps us to appreciate that the digital threat isn't a, a thing, right? It's not just something, as you mentioned, because of industry, because of vertical. It's not just something that you just buy and put in place, but but it really is something that you need to think about. Uh, you need to have a plan for, and um, you know that's an area hopefully that Razor Leaf can help some some of our our clients uh, get through that. Um, I think we have some time for a few questions. Um, Kristen, can I turn it back over to you to moderate? Uh, hopefully, we got a couple questions that came in. Yes, thanks, Derek, and thanks, Jonathan. Um, let's get started with uh, a few questions. Just a reminder, if you do have any questions, please enter them into the question panel. And I think we have one here, and it's, the first question is, do I need a full-blown PLM system to be able to have a digital thread? Yeah, I'll take that one if you don't mind, Jonathan. I mean, I, I think that that you know, as we looked at how how PLM maps the digital threat, it certainly is helpful. But we recognize that a lot of people aren't at that point where they have a full blown, mature, robust PLM system. Does it help? Sure, it helps. If you have a PLM system that has data in it and has those data relationships already in place, then building that digital thread um, can be easier. But the other thing to keep in mind is that a lot of the stuff we talked about doesn't come from PLM. It comes from other systems anyway. So having a full bound PLM system is not a fundamental requirement, um, but instead it's a nice to have. We're going to have to connect to other systems as well. So um, you know the, the digital thread can begin to be built even in the absence of a mature, robust PLM implementation. Yeah, I agree, Derek. I think I think you're spot on there. Good. What else we got, Kristen? Great, thanks, Derek. Uh, the second question we have is, is the digital thread the same as the digital twin? Ah, I ask myself that all the time, Jonathan. I'll, I'll <laughs> that one. Yeah, no, it's it's a great question and it's it makes sense that people would ask it. I The way I view it is no, they're not the same thing. Um, and you can use a digital thread to build a digital twin. So the way I, I define a digital twin, and, and maybe we should have put this in the slides, is a digital twin is a digital representation of a specific physical instance of your product. Now, there are industries that would say, well, actually, it's a representation of my process or, or the other variants on that, but let me just go with that for a minute. So it represents serial number one, and what's the digital representation of it? So you'd use all that data we talked about in the digital thread, that's the virtual representation of your product. The, the CAD models, the specifications, the, the constraints, the loads, all those things that can represent that physical product. You're gonna marry in that physical instance tracking, right? Because serial number one looks a little different than serial number 26. So it might use rev B of a, a part instead of rev D of a part. So you have to kind of put it all together and follow those connections in the digital thread. That's why the digital thread helps build up a digital twin. But your digital twin represents that one unique physical instance. As that physical instance changes, right? Let's say we're talking about an aircraft and you swap parts off. You have to keep track of the as maintained structure of that thing to know exactly what's on it to have that twin. So that's what the digital twin is. And it's very useful for doing predictions on will that one fail? How will that one behave? But you needed that digital thread to build it up and to maintain your digital twins. So 
hopefully that that explains the difference and how they're related. Yeah, I think so. Good, good. Anything else, Kristen? Thanks, Jonathan. Um, it's about five minutes or less to the hour, and so we can take one more question. Um, the question is, digital thread seems like just another buzzword. How is the digital thread different from what a PLM does? Yeah, that, that that's a good one because we know in the PLM world that a lot of times there's there's new buzzwords that that's really just rebranding of the same the same thing. Um, I, I think that when we when we think about digital thread and particularly when we look at the overlay that Jonathan put of those digital thread components on top of PLM, we can see that it's not just another name for PLM. What do you think, Jonathan? I, I agree. I mean, it's they're clearly related, and if you had uh, a really robust PLM that had all the modules you wanted for to support your digital thread, they would look very similar. But I think you're always going to find that there are things outside of your PLM system that you end up needing to connect. There's some data that's going to live in other systems. There's some data that's specialized. Um, and you're also, things are going to change over time, right? Where you add in a new tool, your PLM doesn't manage that data yet, but you need to connect it in. So there will always be differences between them, I think. Um, and sometimes you may find that your strategy is is not to try and put everything in your PLM, right? So I'll, I'll give another example there. Um, somebody who works heavily in a supply chain, right? You may have a PLM for your data, but a lot of the data about your products actually lives in the systems of your partners and vendors and things like that. So your digital thread may need to span across your systems and their systems and, and all over the place and reach out like, like a spider. Um, in that case, they really don't overlay a ton. Yeah, there's some core things that do. So I do think they're different and you should think about them differently, but hopefully you can get a lot of synergy out of it and leverage a lot of what PLM has to offer to build your digital thread. Very good, excellent. Well, good, so that kind of brings us to the conclusion. Um, what, what can you do from here? Well, there's there's a couple things I'll throw at you. First, um, you'll notice there's a link there to a digital thread um, maturity assessment. Jonathan mentioned in his closing slide about kind of taking stock of where you are, identifying the gaps. Uh, Ray Julie's put together this digital thread maturity assessment that, that kind of helps do that. It walks you through some of the questions and asks uh, questions about importance of these things and, and where you are in your organization. And so we'd encourage you to, to head over there and take that, that uh, maturity assessment and get an idea of, of where you are and where some of those gaps may be. Uh, the other thing is we'd like to, to see everyone back in two weeks. We've got another webinar in this series, which is three ways to get started with the digital thread journey. So let's take some of this conceptual stuff that we talked about today, and let's talk about how you actually do it and, and what are the steps that you need to take. There's lots of steps. We're gonna focus in on three of those steps that we think are uh, some of the low hanging fruit. And so we'd like to see you back in two weeks. Um, you can go to our website and register for that webinar. And, um, and you know, we, we'll talk about, you know, really where the rubber meets the road and, and how we do those things. So I want to thank everyone for joining us. As Kristen mentioned, everybody that has joined us, you'll get a, an email thanking you along with a link to the recording. And so feel free to share this with your colleagues. Uh, any questions that you have, um, email us at Razorleaf. You can email myself or Jonathan uh, directly. You can email our sales group and we'll be happy to, to answer those questions. And like I said, we hope to see you in two weeks. Thank you very much.